Okay. Let's rewind back to 2004, and that's where the story begins. At the time, I was doing an unpaid internship in strength and conditioning under the legendary Doc Crease at UCLA. So Doc had won, you know, National Strength and Conditioning Coach of the Year a couple different times, and he had been at Vanderbilt, he'd been at University of Colorado, and you know, and then before that, he was the uh, um, he was the head of. Um, like athletic director for the Georgia State Penitentiary. And he worked with like the likes of like Chuck Braxton and some legendary jailhouse lifters back in the game. This guy was old school. He's retired now. He would not last today because he was too much of a hard ass. He was a, a total hard ass. And, he, and his philosophy was lift really heavy and beat people with extreme condition. He, he was a total throwback. So that's who I was around every day. I used to, that, I was doing some crazy stuff when I was training there, primarily strongman. So I go down to UCLA, it was about 100 miles from where I lived. So I go down there every Monday, work for the day, then that night I would stay at Six in the Wood. It was a Motel Six in Inglewood. Inglewood is not a nice area, um, you know, to say the least. And it, it, so it was, pretty, it was, a, it was, a, it was a pretty just kind of good, rough and tumble, you know, kind of Spartan existent time. I was like a priest. And this was, you know, this was essentially my monastery. I was training for strength. I was learning about the acquisition of strength, all that kind of stuff. So it was, it was great for the time. Well, anyways, um, after I'd get done with the internship, I trained really heavy. And then Doc loved it. He would turn up the heavy metal music and, and it was just a really nice, like synergi just synergetic environment. It was great. Well, anyways, um, one day when I was lifting, I was getting done. Back then, they, this UCLA was sponsored by Metrics. So they had, you, know, you could have like, it was like a buffet of uh, metric shakes. So anyways, um, this dude that was kind of, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, like some crypto Olympic lifter that was kind of built like Pee Wee Herman. He kind of romanced me with a metric shake. He said, hey, you know, I saw you, you know, bust your butt. Would you like a, would you like a metric shake? And, um, you know, I really wanted one. I was tired. So I said, sure. So anyways, this dude comes over there and he proceeds to essentially like give me the Sermon on the Mount about Prilipin's table and how it applies to all things strength. And, and during this time, you know, it's basically this is like, you know, blessed are those that, you know, use Prilipin's table. But the guy sounded polished. And, and I've always been doing a good job of separating the message from the messenger. So the, is this person a poodle dick? Um, the couple other times I, I've seen them work out in their intensity wise and all that, I, I would definitely have to, to make that you know, assertion and, um, but you know what? He sounded very polished. So I'm going to listen to the messengers. You know, it's not always about the messenger. Sometimes, you know, in unsuspecting places, you actually get a decent message. So it sounded very interesting about Perlopin Stable. So, um, and I have a link to an article about it. You know, the subject I'm putting at the bottom of the video, you are free to look at, you can look at it, see the chart and all that stuff. If you're not familiar with the chart. Well, anyways, um, this, you know, so he, he sounded pretty good. So I want to go home and investigate it. So uh, I'm going to tell you why I do not use that chart for strongman and powerlifting. And it was uh, because of my research. So the first off, the chart um, was, the chart was designed by A.S. Prilipin. And it was designed for Olympic lifters. It was not designed for powerlifters or strongman. Okay. So what Prilipin did is he, t he found, um, you know, over th he found thousands of the best lifters in the former USSR, you know, in the 1970s. And he looked at, you know, how, how many lifts they did at each percentage of their one repetition max. So he got all that information and he basically dispersed it as like, this is sort of like the training Bible based off of what the best were doing. So we got to, you know, let's just say that supposition is correct that all these people were training like totally optimal. It's still, you know, fine. It's still for an Olympic lifters. And, and at that, USSR Olympic lifters. So when they get done training, there's a nutritious meal waiting for them. They have massage therapists at their disposal. They don't work that. They don't work you know, a normal job. Contrast that to a powerlifter that spends 12 hours in the oil field, then hits the gym. It's a totally different scenario. Okay, so basically the chart was based on a law of averages. Okay, and um, you know, and uh, and even if it was for powerlifting, which it was not. This law of averages is for elite athletes. And a lot of times, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'm gonna get into that in a little bit, but anyway, so basically what Prilipin did is he, he used, he reversed engineered programs based off of these laws of averages. So, 
instead of saying I'm gonna do this, he looked at the averages, reverse engineered it, made it a program, okay? So Olympic lifting is a test of speed strength and it's very technically demanding. So you contrast that to powerlifting, it's all about limit strength, but it's a much and it's a much simpler technique at that. Strongman tests everything. You better, you know, you better have some conditioning and be able to go hard for one to two minutes in a lot of the events. It's gonna taste your limit strength, but rarely is it just such an explosive strength thing. I guess there's some overhead sandbag throws, things like that, where it would be, where there's no grinding out or anything, but it's very rare. So strongman is gonna test a little bit of everything. Powerlifting is pure limit strength. Powerlifting is the only sport in the world where you lift as much as you can, have to produce as much force as you can, but there are no limits on time. Assuming the lift is not, you know, there's no technical violations. If it took an hour to complete it, that would be within the rules, okay? Powerlifting is more, is much more an equation of brute strength than Olympic lifting is. So that would be definitely a reason why you wouldn't want to use Prolopin's chart if you're, you know, as a Bible for powerlifting, okay? The analysis, like I alluded to early, was done on elite Olympic lifters. So one of the issues with using elite athletes as sort of the laws, law of averages, there's a lot of differences. Um, most of these, a lot of these elite athletes are outliers, especially when it comes to Soviet Union, because what they would do is kids, they would test out to see where they're at. So you would basically, you know, at, you know, have whatever age as a kid, test out and see what kind of sports route, if you're going a sports route, or, you know, I guess get thrown in a gulag or, <laughs> or, um, you know, you have to go to a work camp or something. But anyways, they tested out to find these outlier athletes. So, you know, for the average powerlifter, um, they they wouldn't be this outlier. And even the elite powerlifters would have different, you know, different strengths and weaknesses than, you know, elite Olympic lifters. So, um, and even if all else is equal, like I said before, these athletes in the USSR had, you know, access to all sorts of recovery modalities and they did not have any sort of jobs. Most, athlete, most elite athletes are fast gainers, so the volume and intensity requirements are gonna be a lot different than slow gainers. They don't need as much volume and they don't need as much intensity. As I always say, if you wanna work for NASA and your IQ's 80, you better hit the damn books. It's not gonna be like, oh yeah, study less. The same thing with weight training. If you do not have the genetics that are favorable for it, you're gonna to have to work harder. You have to do more and you have to do it more often and with greater intensity to get the same gains, okay? Olympic gold medalists in Olympic lifting, on average, are 25 years old. Ode Hagen dominated professional strongman into his 60s. Okay, most elite powerlifters are over. You know, are over. A lot of them, or a lot at least, are over the age of 35. So there's another big difference. The chart's too broad. Okay, the because um, and and not only is the chart too broad, fast gainers cannot do near the amount of reps as slow gainers. So if you said everybody should lift you know, eight max, you know, eight total repetitions at over 90% and one person's a fast gainer, one person's a slow gainer. The fast gainer may damn near burn himself out. The slow gainer may feel like he didn't get a workout in pretty much. And furthermore, the, those ranges are pretty broad, okay? So 80.1% is a hell of a lot different than 89.9%, basically 90%. Where in this chart, they're classified as pretty much the same thing. So um, that's like comparing, you know, your some nasty ass Budweiser beer to the best Trappist beer, brewed beers in the world. You don't compare Budweiser to Wes Veltron, bottom line. Okay, also for powerlifting, it's very important for lifters to learn to grind, okay? So no one's gonna ever grind, no one's ever gonna grind out a snatch. Okay, that, that does, <laughs> that sounds bad, okay. No one's gonna have to struggle for a snatch. Okay, no one's have to struggle, struggle to catch a snatch. I guess I can't put it any better way, but anyways, you get what I'm saying. It's against the rules for one. You can't catch it and kind of grind it out. For two, there's no way you'd be as efficient that way. If you're gonna lift any kind of weight beyond like pygmy weights, you can't do that. Okay, in powerlifting, you're gonna to need to learn to do that. And the way you learn to do that is gonna be, you know, with more reps and, you know, and, and really heavy weight where, you, you know, you're having to grind it out. So. Even people like um, Jeremy Hornstra and, and, um, and TD Smash, you know, they're the most fast twitch guys in the world. They've benefited to be able to grind out weights. So they might not be able to do as many reps, you know, TD 500 for six reps, you know, benches over 661 in the IPF overseas. So, I mean, with all that travel and all that. So point being, he's not great at reps. However, he's gotten better at him. 
He used to not be able to grind out of weight. Now he can. So that, that's been a huge thing for him. Okay, so the chart was, the, the, this chart was designed for ideal barred speed. So that's another reason why it would not hold up in powerlifting because in powerlifting, for one, it doesn't matter. If it's, I mean, I'm all about compensatory acceleration training, the submaximal weights I've talked about here before. But in powerlifting, at the end of the day, for you know competition purposes, it doesn't matter at what speed. That it, powerlifting is limit strength, how much weight you can lift in one all out effort, regardless of time. Olympic lifting is strength speed. It's a totally different thing. So identifying what the optimal bar speed is for a strength speed assessment is different what it would be an Olympic lifting assessment. Okay, there are too many other variables not addressed in this chart. So for instance, okay, should all these lifts be done in one training session, in eight training sessions throughout one day, in 20 sessions throughout you know, seven days, or, or you know, how frequently you train each lift? What about assistance exercises? Okay, great. It's just like, uh, what intensity? So a lot of people that like swear swear that this chart is like some sort of holy ground will say, oh, we don't count assistance exercises in, in there. So that doesn't make sense. So, I mean, you can say what you want. So they're, they're basically if you're just half-assing the assistance exercises, fine. But not everybody's, you know, training like a total twat waffle. Some people are pushing it to the extreme. So let's just say, for instance, you're doing a bench press. Okay, so then your your first accessory movement after that bench press is a three board, you know, a three board close grip. However, on that three board close grip, you can do about 100 more pounds than you can with your regular set, you know, your regular grip. It's more than your true max. So would that not have any effect on, on your um, central nervous system, on your connective tissue, on your muscles? Of course it would. <laughs> I mean, come on. So, you know, it also like, I think the, you know, we talked about uh, the seven granddaddy laws here a while back in general adaptation syndrome. And you can contrast that with a fitness fatigue model. The fitness fatigue model actually looks at, um, you know, a certain amount of intensity to have that training effect and what it does. Cause um, the fitness fatigue model is gonna actually factor in, you know, the kind of, you know, it's gonna actually factor in how difficult things were what the intensity was needed to get something done where you know gas is more of just like you know like this chart where you know basically if you're having you know x amount of reps over 90 percent it's not a whole lot different than you know 65 percent as long as you stay in these optimal ranges and i assure you if you're a fast gainer doing um you know four sets of double at 95 percent probably is not even possible but if it is it would have a lot different you know effect than you know training you know, 15 total reps at 70, you know, 75%. So it, six triples at 55% is not the same as 10 singles at 90%. That's, that's totally true. So does the fitness fatigue model that all that being said, even apply to this chart? So the, there's a number of reasons here why I do not use Prilipin's chart for powerlifters um, or strongman. So I'm gonna post a link to the article about it so you can see the chart if you wanna have more information about it and see a more polished version on this is basically just a rant in my kitchen. Now you can see like the, a more polished article with it. So appreciate it and um, have a great day.